There's an old phrase which I like, papering over the cracks. Tied to the practice of putting up wallpaper in old homes, it means to cover significant problems with a semblance of agreement and order. When I look at what's happening in the Democrat Party in America the last several years, that phrase always comes to mind. There's a nice appearance of party unity, but underneath the structure is fractured and about to crumble. Now, at the risk of offending my conservative viewers, I think that it's time to strip back the paper and show everyone the cracks. I may be a Republican, but we need rational leadership from both conservatives and liberals in order to run the country properly. So it's time for some roasted opinions about this. America is a constitutional, federal, democratic republic. The people have a written contract with the federal government which includes many limits and safeguards against governmental abuse of power. Sovereignty is divided between the nation, individual states, and the people as a whole by the Constitution. The people are polled periodically to determine who will be their chosen representatives in government. Those elected representatives then handle the day-to-day -day business of government in order to provide a safe, free, and prosperous country to the people. Now, historically, in America, the politicians have been divided into two major parties. One is typically more politically and socially conservative, and one is typically politically and socially more liberal. Now, it wasn't always the case that the Democrats were the more liberal party. During the American Civil War, for example, the Republican Party had just upended the political calculus by forcing the Whig Party out over the issue of abolition. And in point of fact, they were the more politically and socially liberal party between them and the Democrat Party. It wasn't until Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal that the conservative portion of the Democrat Party disappeared outside of the Old South, which wasn't going to vote for a Republican less than a century after the end of the Reconstruction due to lingering bitterness over the failed policies and corruption of that era. One last tidbit of history before I start talking about the current state of the Democratic Party. Because it was a party containing people with vastly different agendas, the Democrat caucus in Congress was often noted for their internal dissents. Will Rogers said a century ago that he wasn't a member of an organized political party, he was a Democrat. So keep that in mind when I talk about the Democrat Party discipline. We are in the 2020 presidential election cycle, and as a native-born Iowan, I'm naturally curious about the early presidential candidate field. In my experience, about half of the candidates who have declared for the Democrat nomination will suspend their campaigns after the Iowa caucuses are over. The problem this time around is that I can't tell who will suspend their campaigns, and that's mostly due to the fact that the candidates are so similar to my eyes. Which candidate thinks that Trump is the worst disaster to happen to the country in our lifetime? All of them. Which ones support more radical action on climate change? All of them. Which ones are pro-choice? All of them. Which ones think that America is becoming more racist? All of them. More sexist? All of them. More homophobic? All of them. Run by robber barons? All of them. The only thing which separates Kamala Harris from Joe Biden, Bernie Sanders from Elizabeth Warren, or any of them from any others is their names and personality quirks. I'm serious about this. We know that Beto likes to stand on restaurant counters in the middle of the lunch rush. We know that Elizabeth is one 1,024th Native American. We know that standing in front of Joe is a good way to get your hair sniffed. But as far as policies go, there really isn't much difference in what they want to do, just how they propose to do it, and how they present it. Amy Klobuchar talks about global warming while standing outside in the middle of a Minnesota blizzard. Michael Bennett supported state nullification of federal marijuana laws. Cory Booker has taken a $100 million donation from Mark Zuckerberg on the behalf of the city of Newark Public Schools on the opening day for the movie The Social Network. Steve Bullock didn't tell Bill de Blasio that his former aide was fired for sexual harassment. Pete Buttigieg had to settle a case of possible discrimination when he fired South Bend, Indiana's first African-American police chief. Julian Castro probably isn't the person who should manage affordable housing contracts. The point is that all of them have questionable acts in their histories, so that doesn't make any one of them stand out either. 
from eating salads with combs to possible mortgage fraud, the only things that change are details. That means that absent outside intervention, the Democrat nomination will be decided based upon name recognition and the whims of the legacy media. In Washington, another member of the Old Guard Democrats is running the House. Yet another is minority leader in the Senate. Yet both of them cannot even hold their junior members to account, much less gather bipartisan support for important legislation. Freshman representatives Ocasio-Cortez, Omar, and Tlaib are making headlines every other day, from comparisons between ICE detention facilities and concentration camps, to allegations of tax fraud, to calls to abolish Israel. The new people act as if they are running the show. Meanwhile, Adam Schiff and Jerry Nadler lead a group of Democrats who perpetuate endless investigations of Donald Trump's activities from 1946 to present, as if concocted evidence and specious claims will result in a successful impeachment when the Senate is still controlled by the Republicans. Quick hint, Adam and Jerry, the GOP has a vested interest in voting against impeachment so long as there is no proof of wrongdoing, no matter how much they don't like the president. It's the same vested interest you have, not losing seats in the next election. While they would love to work with you on certain policy measures, as far as cooperating on impeachment proceedings? Um, no. Just, no. The truth is that in this instance, the paper covering the cracks is an overwhelming, unifying hatred of Trump and the body blow he dealt to their plans to dominate Washington for the foreseeable future. The Democrats haven't presented a single workable plan in years. The biggest policy measure in the past decade was Obamacare, and it accomplished few of its stated goals. But roast, the poor can afford health insurance now. Yes, but it became unaffordable for the working class and small business owners, didn't it? Huge premium increases? Soaring co-payments and high deductibles mean that these folks who used to have access to decent health insurance are paying hundreds of dollars a month in premiums in order to pay for all of their own routine health care needs. The problem wasn't solved. It was shifted onto people who were historically safe, straight-ticket Democrat voters at about the same time that then-President Obama told manufacturing workers who were losing their jobs and their pensions that they needed to learn how to code because those manufacturing jobs were never coming back. And yet Democrats still wonder why they are losing their hold on blue-collar workers and their votes. The only way that the Democrats can regain those voters is to spread gloom and doom about the economy to try to slow down economic growth. I've read articles about recession fears for months now on a daily basis. Tariffs will trash the economy. Pissing off global trade partners will trash the economy. The bond markets are screaming recession right now. Blah, blah, blah. Meanwhile, when good news like consumer spending numbers, rising employment, and new market index records come around, they deflate them with, yeah, but prices are also going up, these aren't quality jobs, this is a market bubble, and so on. Ad nauseum. The media is continuing to splash Trump across the front page every day with their latest hot take on his actions. They fill their opinion sections with article after article of Orange Man Bad. They publish polls which predict an epic defeat for him in 2020, and they maintain their closed loop of citing each other in published articles based on Twitter responses to the president, thus creating a false confirmation of opinions as fact. Meanwhile, the Democrat leadership and the Democrat presidential hopefuls keep on mouthing this rhetoric a day after the media publishes it, that primary source of the appearance of party unity. Peel back the paper and you'll start to realize that the only thing holding the House of the Democrat Party together is layers upon layers of wallpaper and paste. They demand action to address global climate change and ignore the fact that the green energy sector is a worse source of pollution than fossil fuels. Yes, it is. Look up the energy inputs and pollution for building and operating wind turbines and solar panels compared to the resulting power generation. Look at the same statistics for long-life rechargeable batteries for electric cars and the waste problems created by those batteries. They demand that voices be silenced because of hate speech and protest when voices on their side are silenced at the same time. What did you expect, folks? Two things have to be true when you allow, much less advocate, for silencing people. People who you don't want to be silenced will be deplatformed in the process. 
and eventually the same tools will be used by those whom you would silence to silence you in your turn. They demand that Trump and his subordinates be removed from office for interfering with a special prosecutor's investigation into allegations of misconduct. Misconduct, it seems, that was evidenced only by a totally debunked dossier as if they had the right to continuously investigate and disparage anyone that they choose to target without limit. Meanwhile, when Trump kicks off his first re-election rally in a packed stadium, they reference the political rallies in Nuremberg in the 1930s. Godwin's Law is expanding its reach in all forms of media now, and thanks to elected officials like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, has even reached into the supposedly well-informed, rational, serious discussions in Congress. Look under the paper. The plaster is crumbling. The wood is rotted. The nails are rusting. The pipes are leaking. And the wiring is frayed. The Democrat Party isn't getting stronger. It's on the verge of collapse. There are 24 major candidates from the Democrat Party going into the Iowa caucuses and over 200 minor candidates whom most people don't even know about. The first presidential debate had to be split into two nights and two groups so that the opening and closing remarks by the candidates weren't the entire debate, and even then, four candidates were left off the debate schedule. And that's not even to mention that left-leaning comedians, pundits, and talking heads are asking for the weaker candidates to bow out before the first debate, and that somehow polls are still claiming that candidates whose numbers against their fellow Democrats are too low to measure somehow defeat the incumbent president by nearly double digits, and that his rally attendance numbers are unimportant when he draws an overflow audience in a 20,000-seat arena, and their average rally audience doesn't break 200. The Democrat Party is even agitating to abolish the Electoral College without amending the Constitution, something which will either fail utterly to survive a trip to the Supreme Court or result in the coalition of states which have signed the popular vote pledge having to give their electors to a Republican despite the will of their own voters. Their candidates are backing direct election, forgetting that minority rights are protected first by ensuring that no one state or coalition of states can control the national elections based upon their population alone. And all of those activists who are busy declaring that everyone who disagrees with them is a fascist are doing a great job of alienating moderates. The center of the Democrat Party is shifting farther to the left leaving many who used to find their beliefs closer to the Democrat platform, now finding that they align more closely to the Republican platform despite still identifying as Democrats and despite the fact that they can't stand Donald Trump. In the 1980s, we called these folks Reagan Democrats, and losing them will cost more than just elections. This time around, they may form their own new political party, so that they can reclaim the center-left from the Republicans. Maybe this is what needs to happen. Maybe we should let the Democrat Party consign themselves to the fringe of politics in favor of a more rational political party. Maybe it will have a catchy name, like the Moderation Party. Or maybe the Democrats will reclaim control of their party from far-left activists. Either way, I still expect to read Trump re-elected on election night in 2020. And smile as I look at all the shocked faces.